Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to our worship service this third Sunday in Lent. Um, as we continue in our uh, theme of again and again, the ways that God comes to us and God meets us again and again. So as we begin our worship this morning, I would invite you to take time, just a moment to, to gather whatever you might need, whether that's the bulletin or whether that's crackers and juice or bread and juice, and we'll be sharing in the sacrament of Holy Communion together later in the service. We would invite you to take a moment to gather that if you haven't already. And some of you may have a candle in your sacred space wherever, wherever you are doing worship with us. And so as we light our Christ candle today, if you have a candle, I would invite you to light that alongside us. So let's light our candles. As we remember that it is the light of Christ that connects us all and that we share in Christ's love together. And now I just invite you to take a deep breath in and to let that go. And to take another breath in and to let that go. And to just begin to become present in this space to one another, to yourself, and to God as we prepare our hearts to worship God. I'm going to invite Terry to share our call to worship. Please join in the call to worship. Again and again, we come to this space. Again and again, we gather as a community. Again and again, we move closer to God. And again and again, God is here. We are met. We are heard. We are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship holy God. Now please join in the hymn of praise. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Verses 1 and 3 can be found in the United Methodist Hymnal 127. join in the prayer of illumination. We make room for you, dear Lord, room in our minds and hearts, room also in our life together. <laughs> Let your words be born in us anew, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your splendor shines in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading for today comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, we found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. He was told those who were selling the doves, 
take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in the three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are always within us and surrounding us. And we just ask this morning that you would open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our ears, that we might hear the message that you're sharing with us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this week, I took several long walks outside to make up for the long period of rain and ice and snow that has kept us cooped up inside for a few weeks. And one thing I noticed is that spring is in the air. It's still cold, but the weather is just a tad bit warmer. The sun has been shining this week. My daffodil shoots are beginning to appear and there are even buds on them. The birds have started singing in the mornings near our, in our, the tree outside our bedroom window. And a few people have already noted that it's beginning to be allergy season as there is pollen in the air. Well, here we are gathered on this third Sunday of Lent at the beginning of spring, when the word Lent actually comes from the Saxon word meaning spring. So it's fitting that the season of Lent coincides each year with the coming of spring. In the early church, Lent was understood to be a season of spiritual spring, a time of renewal when people would be prepared for baptism. Spring reminds us of the coming back to life of nature, which coincides with our celebration of the coming back to life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I find that spring often brings this sense of hope to the surface. I feel that hope is beginning to start bubbling up, not just in me, but in many people throughout our community. And not just about the season of spring that is almost upon us, but it's about seeing a possible end to the long winter of this pandemic. As vaccine production has increased, and at least some people we know, if not ourselves, have started to become vaccinated, more people that I'm talking to have started feeling hopeful that there will be an end to this crisis. The news this week that indicated vaccines might even be available to all adults by May if they want them means that it's beginning to feel truly possible that we will emerge from the long, cold winter of this last year. A funny thing that I've noticed about hope is that hope often coincides with a vision of seeing some possibility, of noticing what could be in the world. This vision may not be full of detail. In fact, it might still be quite fuzzy, but often with hope, there is a sense of something to come. Flashes of images or pictures. Can you see? the possibility of an outdoor barbecue with friends, hugging a family member you haven't hugged in a long time, seeing a loved one for the first time in over a year. Sometimes the vision that accompanies hope doesn't completely look like back to whatever look life looked like before. Perhaps hope is also about what things we have learned from this season and how we want or imagine or envision life to be different after this. Maybe that's a slower pace of life overall. More walks, 
Maybe that's a smaller friend group, but much deeper relationships. Maybe that's less time commuting and continuing to work from home for a couple days. Maybe that's more time dedicated to family members or to hobbies. I suppose it's strange to talk about hope and a new vision for what life could be when reading a text like the scripture we just heard. Because there's not much that at first glance seems hope-filled about this passage from John. In fact, it's up there with some of the hardest passages we have to deal with about Jesus. In the Gospel of John, not only does Jesus come into the temple and drive out the money changers, the sheep and the cattle, and those who are selling doves for the temple sacrifices, but he makes a whip of cords in order to move this along. There's no denying that Jesus is angry. And there's nothing like an angry Jesus passage to split theologians, clergy, activists, readers of scripture, and everyone in between over why Jesus was angry and the meaning behind his speech and actions in the temple that day. If you read this same passage in Matthew, Mark, or Luke's Gospels, we find it in a different place in the Gospel. We find it near the end of Jesus' ministry, right before his arrest. Jesus explains his very strong reaction in the temple in those Gospels by saying, the house of the Lord has become a den of robbers. Jesus' challenge to the temple and the authorities is unmistakable and one of the reasons for his subsequent arrest and eventual death on the cross. He's complaining about people who live their lives doing not so great things and then come to the temple, make their sacrifices, and think that all is well. He doesn't want the temple to be a hideout for those who display no repentance and no transformation. But we read this passage from John's Gospel today, which is quite different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version. In John's Gospel, this scene actually takes place right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, not at the end. There's no political threat here yet. This does not come after the processional Jesus takes into Jerusalem on a donkey that we know of as Palm Sunday, where he directly challenges the status quo and the authorities that be. Instead, this comes after Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine at a wedding. He goes from insisting to his mother Mary that it is not yet his time and reluctantly extending the party to purposefully entering the temple and overturning tables. So why was Jesus angry? What do his actions mean? And even more importantly, what does this have to do with us today? I will be the first to admit that this image of Jesus challenges me. I'm not terribly comfortable in the presence of anger. In this gospel, Jesus is not just angry, but his anger feels violent. How does this fit into some of Jesus' other teachings about anger? It is Jesus, after all, himself who makes it clear that we are not to be angry with other people. In Matthew's gospel, he teaches, I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. There is a kind of anger, wrath or anger, expressed towards another person that is a forbidden kind of anger, an anger that's considered one of the seven deadly sins. But there's another kind of anger, which is not forbidden. Jesus also makes it clear that there is a place and time for what we might call holy anger, righteous anger, anger that seeks restitution and justice, not revenge or retribution. This kind of anger is anger as against systemic evils, like the suffering of children, the exploitation of the vulnerable, violence towards others, harassment, etc. We could name a lot of things in this category to be angry at. The kind of anger that we feel at these kinds of things can be our fuel towards action and change. 
One wise person once shared with me that anger can be useful in discovering and discerning our own sense of vocation and life purpose, what we were meant to do. One question that can help us get at God's calling on our lives is asking ourselves, what makes you angry in the world? What keeps you up at night? Over what do you experience a kind of holy anger? And answering that question just might be both your vocation and the fuel for your labor. So as we come back here to this scripture, we can come with wonder. Why is Jesus angry in this passage? What is his holy anger about? And what does that mean for us today? This week, I came across an interpretation of this passage that I had never heard before that I'm still wrestling with. It provides a new lens, at least for me, in looking at this text. It comes from Amy Jill Levine, a professor of New Testament studies at Vanderbilt University. She takes issue with many of the typical interpretations we've probably all heard in sermons, and in my case, probably also given Although it has long been popularized that Jesus was attacking here the exploitation of the poor and the pilgrims by money changers and animal sellers in the temple who might have been jacking up prices or exchange rates, she writes that there's really no evidence of this, at least not here. She also critiques other popular interpretations that provide two easy answers for Jesus's anger, such as Jesus wanting to eliminate purity laws or Jesus hating the temple Watching Jesus' behavior subsequently throughout the Gospels leads to a different understanding about Jesus' attitude towards those things. Instead, she offers this. In driving the vendors from the temple on that day, Jesus is alluding to the last verse from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 21, where it reads, And every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be sacred to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and use them to boil the flesh of the sacrifice. And there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. In other words, Jesus is anticipating a time when there will not be a need for merchants in the temple, for every house in all of Judea will be like the temple itself. As Amy Jill Levine writes, the sacred nature of the temple will spread throughout all the people. So what does that mean? The temple was understood to be the place of God's presence on earth, God's home, God's dwelling place. It was the focal point for the Jewish faith. Money changers and animal vendors were providing a very important and needed service for the people, especially around festivals such as Passover during which this scene takes place. They helped people offer the sacrifices that were required and were holy and sacred to them. Jesus is imagining and pointing toward a day, which the prophet Zechariah had first pointed out, when all aspects of life will have become sacred. Jesus then goes on to share some confusing words about the temple being destroyed and rebuilt. And of course, this happens frequently in John's gospel. There's a misunderstanding. Someone is taking Jesus' statement literally, which Jesus is speaking symbolically. Destroy this temple, he says, and I will raise it again in three days. A temple that has taken 46 years to build and is still not finished, you can rebuild in three days? There's no way people were buying that. And yet we know, of course, that Jesus was talking about his own body, the temple, The temple is the place, the dwelling place of God's presence on earth. But Jesus' body is also the place where God dwells with the people. I and the Father are one, you might recall Jesus saying, claiming later on in John's gospel. And Jesus' crucified and resurrected body will become our new temple. These words are incredibly important, especially in John's gospel, because by the time that John's gospel had been written down and shared, the temple itself had been destroyed. If we go back to this scripture and this moment in time, Jesus was just beginning his ministry. 
And I wonder if this act, which for sure was a symbolic act, not one that actually caused a revolution or changed anything about the way the vendors operated during that time in the temple, I wonder if it makes the most sense to think of this action more in the line as an act of protest art today. With this action, I see Jesus both critiquing the current system and offering an alternative vision. It seems to me that Jesus is focusing on justice and righteousness together, that Jesus' holy anger is igniting a movement that will point towards what can be. Yes, overturn the tables of injustice. Yes, don't exploit the vulnerable or the poor. Yes, justice, still justice and always justice. But it's a yes and. Yes, justice, and what would it look like if holiness was more pervasive? What would it look like if everyone who came to the temple was trying to live in right relationship with God and neighbor every day? What would it look like to pursue the wholeness of the whole community? Jesus is pointing to a more expansive vision of holiness than coming to the temple to offer sacrifices. It's a holiness that would pervade one's whole life. In her commentary, Amy Jill Levine asked the question, can our homes be as sanctified, as filled with worship as the local church? Do we do our best on Sunday from 11 to 12 noon, but just engage in business as usual throughout the work week? Now, I might sound funny in our context, wondering if our homes can be as sanctified or filled with worship as our sanctuary. After all, we have hopefully very clearly learned through this pandemic that we can worship wherever we are after a year of almost entirely worshiping virtually. But these questions still crop up when, other, when people wonder why the church is closed and other places are open. But let's be real here. The church never closed. Our building shut down. But the church, which is the people did not. People didn't shut down. Our worship did not shut down. I find this idea of holiness spreading throughout the land very similar to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement's description of the mission of Methodism. In some of the documents from one of the conferences he held in his large minutes, Jesus, um, John Wesley summarized his understanding of Methodism's purpose which was never meant to be its own church. He writes this, what may we reasonably believe to be God's design in raising up the preachers called Methodist? To reform the nation, and in particular the church, to spread scriptural holiness over the land. Do we understand God's presence to be with us at all moments? Do we realize that everything we do can be worshiped not just the combination of prayers and songs and sermon that we do on Sunday mornings, but the way that we eat, the way that we work, the way that we are present with loved ones, the way that we savor, the way that we love, the way that we celebrate, the way that we forgive, the way we care, the way that we use our money, the way we spend our time. It all can be holy and sacred and filled with God's and the Spirit's love and grace and presence. It all can show love to God and neighbor. All aspects of life are to become sacred, to be infused with holiness. And can you imagine if we share in this vision with Jesus a time when holiness will have spread throughout the land? Can you imagine what that means for our community and world? In Jesus' time, that meant no more need of vendors for temple sacrifices. But we might have different realities. If you imagine holiness spreading throughout the community in such a way that we see everything as holy and sacred, what do you imagine the result would be? Generosity with others would abound. Loving neighbors would become the norm. We could easily see God's image in all people. Would there be no more need of food distributions or no more need of commissions to study the plight of the poor? Would there be no more need for equity and inclusion councils? 
Would the entire profession of social workers not be needed? Could we ever get to that point? <laughs> now, please don't misunderstand me. Don't go home, anyone, and say that Pastor Michelle doesn't believe in social work. <laughs> I deeply believe in social work and social justice. Perhaps the question I want to leave us with today is simply this. What is it that makes you angry in the world? What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that makes you want to overturn tables? What is it that you could imagine being different? And then the follow-up question is, how are you going to live your life to point to that vision, to share it with the world, and to work towards its becoming a reality and not just a dream? And imagine for a moment with me, what a spring. Imagine what a hope-filled world. Imagine all the new life that we would experience if we at least committed to that, to living that way. And if holiness truly indeed spread over the land. Thanks be to God for holy anger. Thanks be to God for hope. Thanks be to God for new visions. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. I'm going to invite us into our time of affirmation of faith, which you will find in our bulletin, and, and Terry will lead us in. We believe in a God who knows holy rage, a God who stands with the underdog, who passionately protects the suffering, and who overturns systems of corruption. We believe in a God who leads by example, feeding the hungry, welcoming the children, offering water to the Samaritan, eating with the tax collector, healing the sick, preaching from the mountaintop, and offering second chances. We believe in a God who knows that we would lose our way and still said, this is my body broken for you. We believe in a God who knew our capacity for mistakes and still said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And because of this love, we believe that God shows us the way again and again and again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, please join in him. Let us break bread together. Verses 1 and 3 can be found in the United Methodist Hymnal 618. <laughs> to invite you into our time of sharing in Holy Communion. 
And as you know, this is not how we would normally do things. Um, and we would love to be able to gather and be in the same room and share the same loaf together. But we know that God's grace goes before us and is always with us, even as we have to adapt and change to our new realities. So during this season, we are able to take communion together virtually. And so we give thanks to God for that and for, for the ways that we are still the body of Christ together. I invite you for this time to put the, the view on gallery view, because part of what it means to receive the body of Christ in a sacrament is to um, be together, the gathered community. And so this is how the community is gathering in this time and place. I also just want to invite you and remind you that in our tradition, the Holy Communion is a sacrament, but the table is an open table. So that means that all and anyone who would like to receive a, this gift of love and grace is invited um, and encouraged to partake as they are wanting and desiring. Um, so if you have the materials with you, we would just invite you to have some sort of bread or crackers or juice or something that could be considered that or um, that could, could be communion for you today. I'd like to invite us uh, to begin. There's a prayer of confession, and then we'll move into the great Thanksgiving, which has bolded responses, which many of you know by heart. Um, but we would invite you to join in the bolded responses um, and then the Lord's Prayer together. Um, so we'll begin together by, by sharing in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us join in the great Thanksgiving liturgy together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenants with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain, he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord and God of power, mind. heaven and earth, and earth are full of your glory, glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed, Blessed is, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. 
Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, together with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of being the children of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ poured out for us all. The cup of salvation. Now I'm going to invite you to take a bit of whatever you brought this morning. To take and eat and to take and drink from the cup. Knowing that this is Christ's love and grace for us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given your very self to us. Your body, the temple, the place where God's spirit dwells. As we have nourished ourselves with this very same spirit and body, we pray that you would allow us to go into the world and be nourishment for the world. The nourishment of love and grace peace, and justice. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we hear from our music ministry, I just want to invite you, this is our time of offering today, um, and we know that we give in a, the way that we give has completely changed in the last year, um, and so I just invite you, um, as you are able to remember the church and your financial giving and give as you can, whether that's mailing checks to the church or online through our donation option there. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity that has enabled us to do so many wonderful things this year and to think about um, our future and the wonderful things we can continue to do in our community. Now I invite us to listen to our special music from the Aldersgate Choir today. Beneath the cross of Jesus Christ, 
in singing our final hymn in an age of twisted values. opportunities for connection and service, but first I just want to share a bit of good news, which is your sign of hope for the week in the bulletin. Um, we have been accepted into a, a program called the Oikos Accelerator, which is a one-year program that empowers congregations to use their, um, their buildings in ways that help um, align with their mission and ministry. And so um, we are excited to go through this process. You can read about it. Um, if it, this process intrigues you, um, I, I encourage you to, to reach out to me and let me know that. Um, if you would like to learn more, please uh, contact me. Um, we also have different announcements in the announcement portion of our bulletin that center around some Easter things. Um, we will give you updates about Holy Week and what we are planning, which is a combination of virtual and possibly some outdoor things. Um, so keep keep an eye out for those to come. But what you already see here is an opportunity to participate in the Hallelujah Chorus um, and also um, an opportunity to purchase Easter flowers if you'd like to do that. Um, I want to let you know that we will have coffee hour right now, which is uh, which is just an informal time of checking in with each other. Um, and if you have specific prayer requests, I would invite you to write them. Since this is recorded and being sent online, we would invite you to write them to the office or to myself or to join us for our Wednesday prayer call where we share prayer requests um, and pray over them in more detail. Just want to um, give some thanks to the people that made this Zoom service happen. Uh, we want to thank Joel. Uh, we want to thank Millie and the choir. And we want to thank Alice for all their hard work um, in helping this happen and letting us see one another and still hear from the choir. It's just been wonderful. So thank you to each of you. And um, now receive this benediction. And you're welcome to stay for coffee hour after. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all 
now and forever. Amen.